A few Matan updates before we begin our episode. Please note that registration for the second semester of Matan has begun and that the application process for the third cohort of the Kitvuni Fellowship, which is an unbelievable fellowship that enables women, gives them a space to write and gives them also financial security to write, uh, has opened. You could see the Matan website for all details. And while you may be hearing this too late, I do just want to mention that I'm participating in an extremely moving evening, what will hopefully be an extremely moving evening at Matan Ranana on February 21st. It's called Finding Hope in the Dark, a Symposium on God, Faith, and Evil. It's an evening that has two parts. The first is a sort of charuta and discussion with Dr. Tanya White and myself. Then there's a dinner, and then from 8 to 9.30, there will be a panel discussion between Dr. Tanya White and Professor Joshua Berman that will be mediated by me. It's really going to be an evening that's a culmination of a tremendous amount of work and, and thought that both Tanya and I have done together over the years and also that Professor Berman has also been involved in. So if this is not too late, we'd love to see you there. And please check out the Matan website for all Matan events. I'm Dr. Josefa Fogel-Rubel. This is a podcast episode brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. In Parshat Tuma, the people are instructed to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and the Parsha details specific items, the Aon, the Kuvim, atop the Kaporet, and its table and accoutrements, menorah, the coverings and curtains, and the bronze altar used for burnt offerings, for the Ola. On one hand, constructing a central place of worship where God dwells and the people meet him is a phenomenon common to so many ancient cultures, but this specific instruction contains so many unique dimensions that connect to the particulars of our journey and to our unique service of God. Unlike in pagan temples, God does not live in it or eat the sacrifices, but he dwells among the people. It's a meeting place of spirits. After wandering for so long without any central anchor, the erection of the Mishkan provides stability for this wandering people. Leon Cass, in his introduction to the book of Shemot, claims that the way the nation builds is that it rests upon three pillars. The first is the shared experience and lasting memory of oppressive slavery, or what we would today call a shared narrative. The second is a comprehensive law system, in the parashiot we saw uh, in, in the past few weeks. And the third is through the tabernacle, the mishkan, which is the embodiment of their aspiration to remain in contact with what is highest in this world. In each case, God provides initiative and direction, but the people increasingly become co-partners in each of these ventures. The Mishkan's instructions are delivered in seven command units, six of which deal with creative work and the seventh which commands the Shabbat. This is one of the many ways the Mishkan text harkens back to the world's creation and suggests that this particular building project was the completion of the creation process. Not the least verses like Vaikra, Yutet Lamed, and Kafvav Bet, which it was Et Shabtotai Tishmoru Vet Mikdashai Tirau, you shall keep my Sabbaths and venerate my sanctuary, which state this connection outright. During the Exodus, the people transformed their personal homes into sacrificial centers, cooking and eating their Korban Pesach and baking bread, two central elements in the Mishkan service. After committing themselves to an eternal covenant, a national home of worship is set up by them. They have become active building partners after several months of passivity. If Har Sinai was the wedding canopy under which we stood with Hashem, the Mishkan is the home we build together to dwell in and deepen our intimacy with God. This Shemot series focuses on 19th and 20th century commentators and their perspectives on the Parsha. Today's episode focuses on the commentary of the Sfat Emet, and I am pleased to welcome a new guest to the podcast, Rabbanit Yael Shimoni, who is the assistant Rosh Shiva at Yeshivat Risha and is a Ramit for Shiur Bet. She established the Meshivat Nefesh online responsa program for Beit Hillel, and she is also a contemporary fine artist who showcases her work in professional exhibits. Rabbanitia El Shimoni, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want you to bring us first into the world of the Sfat Emet. We'll sort of touch upon what your connection is to his Torah and, of course, what he has to offer us on this week's Parsha. But why don't you sort of bring us into who he was? First, he, he was uh, alive in, 19, in the um, 19th century. 
And uh, also, there's a connection between where he was in Poland and Hasidut Gur here in Israel, uh, that his grandson moved to Israel, and there is a uh, Beit Midrash here. Uh, you, can, you can see the Tziyun in uh, Makol Chaim, those of you who walk among Jerusalem. So that's the Hasidut of Gur, which is connected to the Hasidut of Kotsk, very strong uh, Hasidish Chatzir. And he has a very special biography. He was uh, a son um, of a father who died when he was very young, and he was actually brought up by his grandfather. And his grandfather, Chidush Arim, uh, a very big scholar in Torah and in Hasidut and in Iyun, he's quoted all the time by this Fatimid. And you can see that he brought him up and he really raised him to be the special person he was. He was very exceptional. And also his, his childhood was exceptional, being in that uh, situation of being a young orphan, but also being brought up by the, by the grandfather. It is said, well, and, and, and it's true, that the grandfather saw how great he was, and he had a melamed learned from him from a very young age, and he had a few tna'im with the melamed, that he should uh, wake him up before dawn and learn 18 hours straight. And, uh, like, things that That's are very a, hard... Yeah. Uh, to understand, but he was definitely above and beyond average in many ways. And he became uh, the rabbi at a young age. Actually, his grandfather died, and the Hasidim wanted him to be a rabbi, but he he wasn't ready for that. So he made the Hasidut be part of Rav Alexander's Chatzel until he grew up enough and was willing to become the Rav, but then he didn't sit at the head of the table. He sat in the middle of the table, and I understand it since then, Hasidut Gur, that's how, how they sit. And uh, there was a long part of his bringing up that he wasn't really in contact with people. He was really mostly immersed in Torah. And, uh, and when he became a Hasid Ashrav, so he was very, very short in his speech. And that allowed him to meet many people and answer them very quickly. But he didn't meet them all week. He had the first part of the week, Sunday Batuach, but may, maybe also Monday and Tuesday. I'm not sure. I, I, I heard of it that until Tuesday he didn't see anybody. He would only learn. And then from Wednesday onward, he would meet the Hasidim. I'm not 100% sure about that. Sunday, I'm sure. It's written mm-hmm. everywhere that he did not accept anybody on Sunday. And that's an important uh, biography piece regarding what we're going to learn today. We'll return to that. And he died at a young age. Very little hispedim were said on him because that's the Hasidish way, but one of his sons said that he really lived. So maybe he was young when he died, but he accomplished a lot. I think that what's interesting, even just in that small amount that we learned about his biography, is also this question about balancing the role of a of a rebbe, right? And also your your lamdanut. And I think that your your ability to keep learning Torah, that anybody who in any field, right, whenever you're in a relatively mundane teaching role, or obviously you're something much greater, like the Rav of a Chatzir, of a Chasidut, there's this question of like, how do you keep growing yourself while also having to fill a communal role and like to have to create red lines around, you know, what are those white spaces that you think create learn in versus those times that you that you meet people? You know, I, we recently finished a children's book about the Rabbi of Lubavitch that we read at the table on Shabbat. And, you know, there's so many stories about how he's meeting people and speaking with them. And I mean, he didn't sleep. <laughs> Everybody has their own red no, lines. The, the, the rabbin really seemed not to need to sleep so much and not to eat so much. But even then, there's just so much time. And then there's yeah. a, a question. And, I, you know, maybe that's also part of what draws me to him. He has lines. And he found a way to live his own spiritual life and still be connected to people. And that is mm-hmm. definitely something that, that, I ha- that is on my mind. If we want to grow as Torah scholars, we really want to grow. And, of course, you learn from your Talmudian, but you also have to continue on your own. So how, yeah. how do you balance that? I'll also just say for anybody who hasn't opened up this Fatimet, basically the book reads as a running series of drashot. It's organized by year. It says every parasha, it's organized and labeled by which year it was set in. Sometimes there's some really interesting historical pieces you can put together based on if you follow those years. And so it reads like like drashot. Some of them can be repetitive because they're really, he's, from what I also saw, I think he used to, 
write on Sundays. That's why he wouldn't meet with people because he wanted to write down everything he said on Shabbat uh, so that he wouldn't really miss anything. So things are relatively nicely labeled. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, bring us into the Torah or the theme that we are going to be speaking about today on Poshat Tulma. Okay, so I'll just add that the uh, Sfat Abed is is rare in that that he himself wrote his Torah. Mm. Many other rabbis, you have their students writing their Torah. And also his writing of the Torah was for himself in many ways. And as I said, he was known to be somebody short in speech. So his Torah are very, very dense and cryptic. It is quoted that Rav Kook, when he learned him, he said it's like learning Rishonim. So that's another joke on the Sfatimet that people who are lamdan mm-hmm. like him because yes. really... It's, it's really the same kind of method of deciphering you have to do with these very dense texts. And there's a lot of repetition, but also a lot of nuances in repetition. And I want to uh, dwell upon a very central Torah of the Svedimit. And um, there are a few parashot that you can walk into this Torah. And in Sefer Shmot, I would choose either Beshalach or Truma. We decided Truma. In Sefer Bereshis, Vayetze is a very good place to start. And this is the the turning, the special chiddush that the Sfatimid has regarding Shabbos. As you stated also, our parsha, um, parsha Truma, is part of a whole theme that connects between Mishkan and Shabbat. Mm-hmm. So we know that learning about the Mishkan will help us understand Shabbos. It's still unclear. It's very, very cryptic in, in the Torah itself. What is the connection between the Mishkan and Shabbos? Honey. Uh, that's the beginning of Parashat Vayakel. And then after that, we continue to learn about the building of the Mishkan. So why is the Mishkan, Melechet HaMishkan, and uh, Shabbos connected? Where is Shabbos in the week? What the, is it the beginning? Is it the end? Is it somewhere else? What would you say? I mean, I think it's at the end based on the story of Riyat Olam. Oh, uh, you learn Tanakh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the culminating day of Riyat Olam. It's, it's definitely at the end. from Kilui, the end. So the end is Shabbat. So the Sfadimet says something different. And the big question, how can he dare go against what's written in the Torah? So I'm looking at uh, the year of Tafresh Nun Gimel. Here he's talking about the menorah, on one of the kelim. Binyana menorah, shlosha kne menorah mitzida achad, v'chulei. So the Basuk says, it's, it's an interesting Pasuk describing how the menorah was built. Uh, it has seven nerot, so three on one side and three on the other side. Now this theme of one side and the other side is a theme that we know in Parashat B'Shalach, um, Aharon V'chur uh, um, uh, hold Moshe's hands, echad ve'echad. And then the Kruvim is also echad ve'echad. And the Menorah is also echad ve'echad. So, so we know that theme, and it's an interesting way of describing the Menorah. Um, you could have described it, described it in different ways. And the Sfat Ahmed is asking why, why did the Torah decide to describe the menorah in such a way, to describe three on one hand and three on the other hand? Right, we're being told it's in two units as opposed to created from one piece. No, and after okay. the menorah, there's a, very, uh, there's a lot of strength it's on it being from one piece. piece. Yeah. So the Sfat Ahmed, I've written in a other place, because he writes to the Shabbat, שבו מתגלה אור התורה, לכן יש בו קריאת תורה ומתפשט הערת התורה לכל ששת ימי המעשה. So first says the Sfat Emet, you should know that the menorah is actually describing Shabbos. It's Pchinat Shabbos. On Shabbos you have the light of the Torah, and that's why you have to read the Torah at Afka on Shabbos, because something happens there. If you read the Torah on Shabbos, then the Torah will actually spread to the entire week. But here... The Sfatimah did not explain yet why are we talking about three on one side and three on the other side. So he says, first of all, you have to understand the way the, the menorah is built. It, there's a difference between the two kanim from each side and the uh, one in the center. The one in the center has four gvi'im, and the three have just three. Why is that important? He doesn't say. It is still very cryptic. 
And when we learn this Fadimet, we know that if we find something that is hard to understand, we have to look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And as he stated himself, he wrote it already, Bemakom Achir. Gam Shivat Nerot HaMenorah, Hem Zayn Yemei HaShavua. Okay, this is exactly what he said in the story. You should know that the seven candles of the menorah are the seven days of the week. Vehashabbat Ner HaEmtsai. So which Ner is Shabbat? Not the last Ner, not Ner HaMa'avi. That we know there's Ner HaMa'avi that, that lies from one Shabbos to the next. No, it's the middle. Shlosha Yamim Kamei Shabbata Ubatar Shabbata. מתבטלים למול האמצעי, ואז יאירו שבעת הנרות. So says the Sfat Emet, the way the week is built, there are three days before Shabbos and three days after Shabbos. And if you work that way with the week, that's how the week connects to Shabbos and, and gets the light of Shabbos. אף שקאי רק על השישה, הכתוב מחברם שביותם מתבטלים לאמצעי, נעשה ההערה מכל הזין כאחד. So here we have a Chiddush. The Sfat Amit is saying here that the Shabbos is in the middle of the week. I just want to stop you for one second and say that immediately what I'm thinking about when I read this, right, I'm, I was in my head sort of doing the math, quote unquote, mm-hmm. right? So because famously the story of the creation of the world divides up into two halves, okay? So I'm immediately thinking that instead of going with the order of days, as it works in Bereshit, he actually goes with the thematic parallels between the days themselves. So he's, he's, he's lining up those days. It still doesn't really answer the fact that this is totally changing the way that, right, in, 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 the, in the creation of the world, we sort of have like this upward, this upward climb, right? Also the hierarchy, we're getting to humans. We go to, you know, it takes all the vegetation, humans, we get to Shabbat, which, you know, is some sort of wedding of, of the human and the divine. So... I'm still on this journey with you, but I'm just saying there is something about what he's doing, which is something that we are familiar with from a biblical perspective of there are these parallel days and he's somehow taking that form as opposed to the sort of thing of like a pyramid going up. You know, he's taking that form. You're making a very strong point, but but that is a very late development. Not late, it's late cognitively. I mean, yes. in order to... to, yes. to what you're touching upon now, I'm, I'm writing a series of Shurim. I'm at number 15. Like, that's where I reach this point. Because mm-hmm. there's a big question on Svetimin. Mean, how does he read Parashat Bereshis? So one of the options is, as you said, that the first day has a twin. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fourth day, mm-hmm. right in the second day. And then Shabbos is left alone. And there's a Midrash saying that the Shabbos says, we're the doesn't have, can, yeah. we're, Knesset Yisrael yeh ben zugech. Yeah. So he definitely has Torah regarding that. Mm-hmm. But a simpler explanation, which I can show you later, is that he reads the word Vayachulu differently than us. He says Vayachulu is from, like the Midrash says, Na'asu kelim. And he b'chal thinks that the days of our week are not repeating Maaseh Bereshis. Our Sunday is not the Sunday of Bereshis. No, we're in a different story. What exactly is the connection between our week to that week? Mm-hmm. And that's also an interesting way uh, to look at this week. We're, we're used to thinking, oh, we're, we're now repeating Briyat uh, Olam. And Svanimet says, no, you're not doing Briyat Olam, you're doing something else. You're in a different story. The world finished, that, that, that's one story. Masebi Rashi, we don't understand it. I can tell you what happened since. Is it written these three days before Shabbos and three days after Shabbos? Again, as uh, he says it in Aramaic, Shloshamim Mikame Shabbata, Shloshamim Batar Shabbata. Actually, it's a sugiya in Gitin. Yeah, in Gitin, there's a question what, what happens if, uh, if a man says, Give my wife a get uh, at the end of the week. When is the end of the week? And the halacha is that the end of the week is Tuesday. Halacha mm-hmm. Begitin. Mm-hmm. And uh, then a uh, different sugya in Masachat uh, Psachim says that that's also how we know that you can do Havdalah till the third day of the week because mm-hmm. that is the end of the week. That halacha is rather famous. 
I think uh, we like, I like to teach it to my teenagers at home when they miss Abdullah. Mm-hmm. Oh, so now you can do it till Tuesday. Uh. Right. <laughs> Except you can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't eat. So if you want to eat, you want to eat this, fine, right. just do Abdullah. So, so that's a famous halacha, but let's look at what this halacha says and see that it's written in the Gemara that in, in a way, really, Shabbos ends on Tuesday. The week ends on Tuesday. And there, why does it say it ends on Tuesday? Because it's halacha. Uh, another halacha you might know, the uh, Bala Ma'o, uh, when he explains why you have to take three days in advance before uh, you travel for Shabbos, he quotes the reef. The reef explains why do you need to take three days because it, it, you, you can be nauseous or you could be mevatel on Shabbos if you do it too quickly. Mm-hmm. So Bala Ma'o says, uh, uh, I don't think so. He's a big chutzpedic uh, towards the reef, as we know. So he says, uh, I have a different... I have a different uh, option for this. I think that the same halacha of, the, of Avdallah is re- relevant to here. That the end of the week is Tuesday. So you want to start going for Shabbos, the first day of the week is Wednesday. Fine, mm-hmm. you can start in the beginning of the week. You can't, further on, you're too close to Shabbos. So that's, uh, that's another halacha. Okay. I'm just adding, I'll add two more things. Shir Shalyom, uh, Ashkenazi, Sfard. Uh, say at the end of Shir Shel Yom of Yom Revi'i, we have, uh, every day has its own uh, parak and tehillim, and the parak of uh, Yom Revi'i, El Nekamot Adonai, El Nekamot Ophia, and then at the end, after we finish the parak, we read a whole parak of tehillim, and suddenly, three psukim are added, Lechun Neranana L'Adonai, Nerea L'Tzuri Shenu, Nekadma Panav Metodah, Bezvurot Nerea Lo. That's the end of Shir Shel Yom Shel Yom Revi'i. It's taking one parak of Tanakh and then adding why is it there? So it is a common thing to say. We're, we're starting to get ready for Shabbos. It's already Kabbalat Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And you can say Shabbat Shalom from Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So there is something in, in, in our halacha and minhag that, that gets a feel of what he's, he's talking about. Mm-hmm. But again, what is the meaning of this? Uh, and where does it come from? So where does it come from? We know there is... There is another option that the Shabbos is in the middle of the week. We just didn't notice, this as, notice it as much, and we have to find a way of reading Bereshis. And I said, we gave three options already of how to read Bereshis. Lo alman Israel. But what's the idea behind it? Because that's very foreign. Like, I, I know how you feel. For me, at the end of Shabbos, Motzi Shabbos, how do you feel Motzi Shabbos? I'm starting something new right now. Yeah, I feel Motzi Shabbos some... Um, Falling from a cliff into darkness. Oh, it, tired? I'm definitely tired. <laughs> but also, I don't know, it's like, vaya nefesh, Yeah. You're saying you have to climb back up out of Yeah, out it's of an that. anticlimax. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's the end. It is the end. It mm-hmm. is not the middle. No. It's, it doesn't feel emotionally no, no. the middle of anything. No, it doesn't. Uh, it feels... That was pretty dark once it's Shabbos. And Sunday for me is not uh, a day of a lot of strength. Many times it's, it's a day of weakness. Yeah. So, so he's describing here something else. Mm-hmm. He's saying, actually, that Sunday is the closest day to Shabbos. And that Shabbos is in the middle. Mm-hmm. Sunday has just been feeding off Shabbos. It should be the strongest day of the week. I mean, we're also obviously very influenced by the Gregorian calendar, meaning we're influenced by... The, the calendar and the way that the whole world is running its week, right? And so he's he's pointing to a system that does not <laughs> fit with the broader world system. So it also goes not just against Shisha Yemei Berishit, but it also goes against just the way that societies around us are all functioning. Look, even sometimes I feel that still, meaning I, you know, my relatives live in the States and they were just sending pictures on the family WhatsApp of what they're doing today on Sunday. And it always takes me by surprise every time again, like, oh, right, this is, they're chilling out today, right? And I, I've already had a full day of work, right? So there's these like competing systems and we still haven't figured out what sits at the core of his sort of Torah, perhaps Kabbalistic system that the mm-hmm. world is not living in. So, so maybe we should see how he lived his life. I just described that he started to accept people uh, to meet them on Wednesdays. I'm not 100% sure about that if it already started on Monday, but I heard that it was on Wednesday, and I still didn't have the guts to ask one of the rebbes. You can ask rebbes questions on, mm. on uh, email. I haven't done it yet. I will. So, but I, what I heard is that he started to have people in 
on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he met people. Shabbos, he gave these Torah to the Hasidim. Sunday, he sat down to write his Torah with uh, Tfilin of Rabbein Utam. And that's how the book Svadimet was created, because mm-hmm. he would write down what he had on Shabbos. So for him, Shabbos was the day of trying to, to look back at what just happened and to hold it. And to somehow keep it going because... No, Sunday. Sunday. Sorry, Sunday was a day that Sunday. he tried to look back. No, okay. Sunday. And and you see that sometimes he writes and he says, I don't remember. And, and it could be that on Shabbos he was on a totally different level. But Sunday is like a way of him trying to reach hmm. and remember and hold on to all of his chavayot uh, ruchaniyot, right, yeah. spiritual that he had experiences. On so it's not it's not that you prepare a Dvar Torah for Shabbos. No, on Shabbos you read the Torah and suddenly you understand it differently and you share thoughts and views and ideas. And then after Shabbos is over, you say, "Oh, what was that? Now I can go back and understand all the chidushim that I had." And that's mm-hmm. how he wrote this book. And this is a very excep- exceptional book that after he died. Immediately that year, that book was already published mm-hmm. because of this form of writing. And it's more than a form of writing, it's a form of living. Saying that the first three days of our week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, for him, were the three days of digesting the spirituality of Shabbos. Mm. It's funny because I still eat, you know, we eat food from Shabbos. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So leftovers. We, we digest the leftovers. the leftovers, but he's. Doing the spiritual leftovers, mm-hmm. and what is he? And he's telling us that this is this is why the menorah is built that way because the menorah is trying to teach you how do you get light into the days of the week. The real light is in the Shabbos, so you have three days of preparing to Shabbos, so that's why they're connecting in. Mm-hmm. But then you have three days that are digesting Shabbos, and those are the days that you are supposed to find a way not to forget the Shabbos that was. But to hold on to it, it's like isuchag, but all the time, mm-hmm. something that will help us after. I think it's also interesting because, you know, where does someone draw the line between this is the way that he found his week to be the most meaningful versus also saying other people should live like this? You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, maybe I should be embarrassed to share this, but like there have been years of my married life you know with the kids and everyone knows that Fridays and Shabbatot together they're overwhelming days there's a mm-hmm. lot going on between cooking and everybody being home and and there were some years where I would say to my husband I, I I feel like Shabbat is taking over my week and I want to feel it less on the other days this is like the opposite of this <laughs> and I would say I can't he my husband he he's more of like the food and cooking for Shabbat uh, point person. And like on Tuesdays, he would want to sit down and make a menu. And I said to him, I, I feel like I can't breathe. I said, I can't. If I make a menu on Tuesday, I just, I, I need to breathe through through the week. So it's like literally the opposite. I mean, at this Why? point, we Defka, from what you said, you can only make a menu on Wednesday. No, so and I'm Tuesday, saying my husband, obviously, was still, a very, very high individual, <laughs> and he wanted it, and I just was pushing back. I'm like, let's talk about this Thursday night. I don't really want to talk about this. But he was like, yeah. So for all of those who are menuing on Tuesday, you are living like the Svadimet. That's basically what we're saying here. We talk about going on vacation. My husband and I, it's like, we finished the vacation, and velo no bal kirbena. Do we feel it after we finished it? So we try to have pictures, right? But do we really feel, can we take uh, the menucha, the simcha, the nachat into our everyday lives? So also Shabbos, that's a big question. Is, does Shabbos give you menucha, the simcha, or something that you can take on mm. to the rest of the week? Or are you really just, you know, burning yourself out on Shabbos and then nothing is left afterwards? According to the Sfat Emet, Shabbat mechin lechol. We're, we're used to saying that Shabbat lo mechin lechol. But he's saying spiritually, Shabbat mechin lechol. Right, it prepares you for the week. Can I mm-hmm. mean, if you, he's saying that it's a vodat Hashem. Can the, maybe, maybe it's only people who are on a higher level. Or don't, don't have little children. Ma osim little children tzich lachshov. Azo sheela tova. Kilu. I can tell you that, that I've been reading this Fatimid and, and trying to live this in my own life and, and I haven't found a way to do it yet. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I still feel Motzei Shabbos, the darkness, the tiredness, and I can't believe another week is starting. How will I get through it? All mm-hmm. of that. And he's offering me a different way of, of living, which I I haven't been able to to live this way yet. I've tried a little. I tried Motzei Shabbos and Sunday to write ideas I had from the last week parsha. When when I teach Svadimed, I always teach on Monday the parsha that was. Oh, interesting. Because mm-hmm. I said, you know, to start from from technically. Yeah. And and when I do that, I do notice that a lot of times I do have new ideas on Shabbos. Mm. Uh, but if I would have more people to share that, like if it would, I would be part of a group that we know. Okay, You're changing your we're spiritual gonna, focus. We're going to tell each other what was when we're Echaya Shabbat, so the answer won't be Ma'achalnu Echaya Shabbat. I had this thought. I will say that Sunday morning is a big gift of my personal lifestyle, is that I, I don't teach Sunday mornings and I have a Chavruta. And whether I think about it as the beginning of the week, which would not be according to the Sfat Amet, or I do feel like it, it could be, like a lot of times on Shabbat you have thoughts Right. And so I do have an opportunity to sit and think about them with someone. And so that is something that I find is special. I never thought about it as a continuation of Shabbat, but I think that's an interesting, interesting way to start to frame that. Meaning because I do have that gift of having a Chavruta on Sunday morning. So and like to look at it as some sort of continuation, I think is, is a really it's a really great idea. I really would like Shabbos to give me energy instead of take away my energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're to, yearning to, for to, that. to see Kodesh as something that feeds me and not eats me. I think he's saying here something very, very important. So also, let's take this a step further, because okay. this is also here in, in Parashat Truma. I want to read um, a Torah that in order to understand that Torah, we have to add another another uh, part in the puzzle. Um, the Sfat Emet quotes in a few places uh, Torah of Rav Shmelke, okay? <laughs> Who's Rav Shmelke? He's another Hasidic rabbi who his Saba quoted him. A lot of times, that's how the Sfatimid is built. The, he brings a quote of Chidush Arim, quoting someone else. Sometimes it's a quote of the Kotzker, sometimes it's a quote of the Baal Shem Tov. There are all kinds of other Torot Chassidiyot inside the Sfatimid. So one of the Torot that is repeated a few times, that already the grandfather was repeating it, was what is the meaning of a very a famous and cryptic Memra in the Gemara, the Rabbi Yochanan and Rashbi say, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Rabbi Yochanan, um, if we would fulfill two Shabbatot in a row, then we would merit the redemption. Yeah, whatever and that means. And we exactly. know that in the uh, parashot, the first Shabbos was uh, given in Mara, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, that Shabbos uh, did not go well because <laughs> people went out to, to to look for the man, mm-hmm. and it looks as if that was already the second Shabbos because the first Shabbos was in Mitzrayim when they took. Korban Pesach. So something in the first two Shabbatot didn't work. If it would have worked, it would have been Gula Shlema. And the question is why? So the Sfat uh has a future order on that, and, and they're connected to what we saw. It, it, Shabbos is in the middle of the week. He asks, what does it mean that Chazal said that Ilu Meshamrim Bet Shabbatot Nigalim? If Am Yisrael would have kept two Shabbatot, it would have been Gula Shlema. So he's quoting his Sabaraba, saying by the name of Rav Shmelke, Shabbat Rishon Hachana, Shiyeh Biyamot Achol, Avoda Karaui, Liot Acharkach Shabbat Karaui. The first Shabbos is to prepare the days of the week, so the Avoda of the week will be a good Avoda, and then the second Shabbos will already be a good Shabbos. So what does he mean here? So he says, a person has to understand, Shabbos has to teach us how to live the next days of the week. Shabbos is a way of us to understand how to work with Kedusha. And the Svat Emet claims that if we look at the two Shabbatot, we can see that the first Shabbat that we got was from God. We got it without working. 
God told us, החודש הזה לכם, משכו וקחו לכם. You take your Korban Pesach, I'm giving you Shabbos, you do this. He gave it out of the blue. But the second Shabbos was already supposed to be a Shabbos that we were supposed to prepare ourselves. Vehechinu et asher yaviu. We were supposed to prepare Shabbos itself. So how does God work with, work with us? God knows that Kedusha is hard. So first, he gives us a gift, matnat chinam, without our working. After he gave us the gift, we have to work hard to analyze, digest, understand that gift. And then we have a new avodah of translating it into our deeds and preparing the next kedusha that will come. So this is like tangoing with God, okay? God made the first move. Mm-hmm. We're learning the moves. Then we're trying on our own. And then the next Shabbos will be a Shabbos that we meet God middle way. He'll come down, we'll come up. And that's the perfect Shabbos. The perfect Shabbos is a Shabbos that is built out of man giving himself up to God and God coming and meeting man in the middle. That's Shabbos. Shabbos always works in twos <laughs> because it's like, um, it's like a wheel of moving us into Kedusha. We will always get something more than God that we can't do on our own, but we're always asked to give our own movement. Right. I mean, that connects with something I said in the introduction, which we see in many places in Sefer Shmot, where this idea that God gives us something and we're supposed to continue it, whether it be the Luchot, right, or even the two separate units about the Mishkan, right? This idea comes up very often in Sefer Shmot and other places, the idea that we need to have some sort of human uh, partnership with God in all these processes. Okay. Yeah, partnership echoing, but he also makes a point of saying that when we meet God again, we meet and then we recede. Mm-hmm. because we we feel that every meeting we have something new to learn. I mean, we come prepared, but there's always something new to, to accept. So if we learn how to do that movement, it's like breathing. <laughs> you breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe. Mm-hmm. That's Shabbos and a Shavua. Chol and Shabbos is that, that breathing movement of us pushing against God, working, working with Him together. So now, after we've seen all that, we can try to read a Torah of his. Mm-hmm. And the Torah in Parashat Ruma, Taf Reish Memchet. Okay, so first statement. Gam perush ve'asuli mikdash bi'imei ha'maseh ve'shachanti hu b'shabbat kodesh. The pasuk that you were quoting, ve'asuli mikdash ve'shachanti betocham, they will make me the, the mishkan, and I will dwell amongst them. We make the Mishkan in the week, and he dwells in us on Shabbos Kodesh. Mm. First statement. Second statement. Ki ha-he'ara ha-mitgala b'Shabbat u'lefi tikun yamei ha-ma'ase. We will receive a new light from God in response to the work that we've given him. We have to work hard, and as hard as we work, then we'll be able to receive more. We build, ki v'yachol, a vessel in order to accept Kedusha. And then he continues, he says, Perashnu ki leholam hu ken. This idea that you work and then you receive, that you build a vessel and then you give Kedusha and then you feed on it and you build another vessel, that's always the case. Leholam hu ken. Osei devaro lishmoa bekol devaro. We do in order to hear. Yeah, that, that's echoing. That's Na'ase echoing. Kedei First you have to create what can then receive, right? You can't assume that the reception is there naturally. And the more you work on receiving, the chances are you'll get more in the next time. Yeah. The light that we get in Shabbos Kodesh, we first have to work and use that light to be Mekadesh the following days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Mm. That, that's where Shabbos is aiming. Ve'az zochim b'Shabbat Hashani li'hitgalut mechadash. If you do that way, the next Shabbos will be on a higher level than the one following. Ki le'olam enefsek le'elu ha'madrigot. It's an infinite. And that's how he, he finishes and he says, ve'ze shemevakshim b'motzei Shabbat ve'yi noam Adonai alenu. Motzei Shabbat, we say uh, another uh, verse of Tehilim. Noam Adonai Ma'ase Adenu Konena Alenu Ma'ase Adenu Konena. We're asking for the Noam of God, the, the Noam. 
the pleasantness the pleasantness of god to yeah. dwell in our deeds right but he's Shabbos, saying first we have to do that preparatory work and then hashem can dwell in us but we have to remember that this is is for sunday mm-hmm. something here happened that is yeah. facing the future we can't take pictures of Shabbos. We have to take the pictures of Shabbos on Sunday. I think that uh, that this, you know, we mentioned in the beginning and in, in the introduction also that there's all these connections to the Mishkan. You know, there's the connection of obviously the Lamatet Melachot, which we sort of like danced around. You know, we have that connection between the Melachot of Shabbat and with the Mishkan itself. And and we have, as, as we said, even just the organization of the Parshiyot of the Mishkan are organized in a series of seven, according to most who understand the structure of it. And here we have something that, as you said, really revolutionizes the way we look at Shabbat through the prism of the of the menorah you, you know you said it before as we were preparing that we'll never look at shabbat the same i feel like to me i'm never going to look at the menorah the same again <laughs> either uh that really it's sort of that there's this centerpiece in our lives and so this fatimet really encourages us to see shabbat as the centerpiece as opposed to looking at it as the culmination or looking at it as certainly something that drains us would also be not the way he's looking at it but it's some sort of centerpiece uh, and i think that well this is not what the fatimet says I think that in general, we it calls us to look upon what sits at the center of our life, meaning here he's speaking about what sits at the center of our week. But I think that for many of us, we're not always aware of what's sitting at our core and what's what can either be draining us or what can be giving us energy. And to me, this really sends me into that direction as well, meaning what's sitting there at the center, right? Is it a value that I want? Is it a thought that Dafka is is harmful, right? But I think that it's a real call to to think about that. And when so I it's interesting what you said, because there's another famous story of this Fatimit. Every mm-hmm. Jew has an inner even if you feel that you're terrible, if you go deep, deep, deep down, you will find the inner core. And your inner core is always clear, pure the place where God feeds you. Mm-hmm. So so for him, where do you find Kedusha? It's always hidden in, in, in your core. And many times uh, it, it, it's, it's something that's worth looking for. Um, I think even on a practical level, there's something about Shabbat, which again, even if it's busy with children, or obviously everybody's listening here is in a very different stage of life, there is something about the, about not doing melacha that at least in theory is supposed to clear some space meaning a person can figure out what sits at their core when they have space where they're not acting right even for me it's just just the act of not teaching for me the act of not looking at my cell phone okay right everybody in their own in their own connecting to people who are next to me and not to people who are not in the same room with me I guess I would, I would serve that up as a, as a tefillah. Yeah, but, but I can tell you that when I, I've been reading Sfatimid, I think, since Shir Aleph. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I like the Sfatimid is because uh, he, he managed to stay with me even when I was in the army and in university and married and children. And because these are very, very short tours. And I felt that when I opened the Sfatimid on Shabbos, he gives me energy. Mm-hmm. There's always something like a line, a word that welled with me, that stayed with me. I didn't have to put a lot of effort. I could just skim through and catch even like a fragment, mm-hmm. and it would be meaningful. Yeah. And that's the kind of tour I needed. I couldn't learn, you know, long passages, Abarbanel, eh, Ramban. Couldn't do that. Uh, I did for when I was not married, but then with children, it was much, was much, much harder for me. But the Sfatimid, I would always open. I, I can take him with me to tefillah. I, mm-hmm. You look through, something catches your, your eye. Mm-hmm. And that would be enough. Because that was the Torah I needed. So for me, if a book gives me that, and, and it dwells with me, also, when I don't have time, that's a specific kind of Torah that gives me chiyut, that gives me power. Sometimes Torah can really drain you, can yeah. be very hard. But Torah can also give you strength. 
Uh, and for me, that, this book has done that for many years. Uh, even before I'm, I understood it or, or saw all these things now, many years later I suddenly see like patterns and things. Patterns. But, but the reason I, I think I'm connected to him is because he gave me this gift of what, what he, he's given himself. Yeah, I'll thank you for this conversation. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. And uh, I think that this uh, is a really meaningful and different perspective on Shabbat that for all of us who are not, have not been reading this Fatimit <laughs> for mm-hmm. the, past, uh, the past while, I'm sure we'll be thinking and processing this. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode from Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact the Matan office or email me at podcast.matan.org.il. Please do us and all women's Torah learning a favor and share this episode with all of your friends and family. 